Support for Conversations Live comes from the members of WPSU and from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and friends worldwide through programs, events, and communications. Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. I'm Patty Satalia. From knowing what to plant, when and where, to fertilizing and controlling pests, May just might be the busiest month for gardeners. Tonight, our experts will provide tips to help you get off to a good start. They'll also take your questions. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, and our email address is connect at wpsu.org. If you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can tweet a question to at WPSU. Now, let's meet our guests. Tom Butzler is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He works with commercial, commercial horticulture operations and the landscaping community in Clinton County. His area of expertise is vegetable production and beekeeping. John Esslinger is a county-based extension educator with Penn State Extension. He works with fruit and vegetable growers in northeastern Pennsylvania and in greenhouse production. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Sorry. Sure. I, I want to get right off, uh, right off the bat, I want to talk about something that I think is of interest to almost every vegetable grower in Pennsylvania, and that is growing tomatoes and the fact that there is actually out there right now a blight-free tomato variety. John, tell us about it. Okay, yeah. There, there's actually several new varieties, and they're just now coming onto the market, and so they're going to be hard for the, the average gardener to find for, for the next year or so. Uh, you can order the seed and grow your own. Uh, the seed's just, just slightly more expensive than normal seed, but it's, it's, it's really worth it. Um, you know, most time early blight or late blight is the thing that kills our, our tomato plants. And so you can grow these varieties, they'll produce, they'll last longer, produce longer, and it's just really nice for gardeners. You actually um, brought some with you. I did, And maybe you yeah. can show us uh, because I think a lot of us get it wrong, how to properly plant a tomato plant. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, these, this variety is, is uh, one of the new varieties. It's actually, it's, it's called Mountain Merit. Uh, Mountain Merit is a variety that's both resistant to early blight and late blight. Um, so that's, And for those who don't know, can you explain what blight looks like and what it does? Uh, early blight will be spots on the lower leaves and often will be yellow around those spots. Uh, those spots are looks like they have rings so it looks like a target um, and it slowly moves up the plant. Late blight and it can come at any time of the season so that name is a little bit deceptive. Uh, but late blight typically comes on the top of the plant and when it hits the plant usually it takes five days to a week and that plant's gone. You, you've lost very, all the fruit, so if it had lots of... Uh, you've lost the entire plant. Okay. It, it, it kills them very quickly. So, yeah, what I wanted to do is just show a little bit about how to plant them. Um, just make sure that uh, people plant them properly. Uh, and for, for our radio audience, uh, I'll try to describe, or maybe okay. you can describe as you're going along what you're doing. Okay, the first thing is you want to make sure when you, you remove the plant from the, the tray, that you treat it very gently. Okay, these are young, tender plants. The roots on them are very tender. Um, so what you want to do is push on the bottom, try to loosen that plant up a little bit. Don't just grab and pull. Okay, once you've got it loose, um, just take it out and hold it gently. A tomato plant is, is a vine, so you want to plant it nice and deep. And when you plant that plant deep, you want to try to put it in, so th these are the coddling leaves, those first leaves. You want to plant it so that uh, the soil comes up about even where those cotyledon leaves are. Um, and I think the tendency is for people to plant it exactly the way it came in the container. Right. And, and there, there's several advantages to planting a tomato deeper. Uh, the first thing is, is that a, a tomato will root out. Wherever the soil touches it, it will root there. So all that stem will, will have roots on it and that'll help the plant. The, o the other thing is, is you're getting that plant nice and low in the soil and the wind in the spring is really hard on young plants. And so having that low in the soil takes some of that wind pressure off of it um, and it just gives the plant a nicer start. And, and John, what are the, what's the best way to support a tomato plant? I guess it, it depends upon whether it's a ch uh, cherry tomatoes or, or what the variety is, but is there some rule of thumb about supporting them throughout the growing season? 
Yeah, if, if you're growing an indeterminate variety, and usually when you buy the plant, the, the label will tell you that it's an indeterminate. Meaning? Meaning that it will continue to grow all season. Uh, a determinate variety grows flowers, fruits, and it's done. An indeterminate variety grows a little bit, flowers, grows a little more, and it'll just keep doing that. So they tend to be tall, lanky type plants versus a, an indeterminate tends to be more of a bush type plant. An indeterminate, you can still stake them, but they don't have to be. Um, an uh, indeterminate plant will just continue to grow, and it's got to be staked. It'll it'll go all over the place if but you don't. But a trellis, a cage, is it, there a, it, a rule of yeah, thumb there? Yeah, different different gardeners have different preferences. Um, I like stakes. Um, I can just start with a nice tall stake, and then just tie it. Uh, you def definitely want to tie them often. Okay, don't let them start to run and then try to force them. If you just tie them as they're growing, it's a lot easier on the plant and they just kind of naturally want to grow up that way. But really, it, it's what you like. Um, I like steaks. And speaking of what you like, and then I'll take our first phone call, <clears throat> do we know anything about how these blight-resistant tomatoes taste? We don't, yeah. Um, Maybe next year when we come back, we'll tell you. Because like I said, these are for my garden. I'm going to grow these and, and we'll let you know. Okay. Um, what I hear is they do have good flavor. Um, I have <clears throat> tasted some. Uh, we had some experimental ones, ones that breeding programs developed but weren't ready to release yet. And when we, we actually did a taste test on some of those varieties, and they rated very well. Everybody said they were extremely sweet. So good news. Yeah. We'll Again, see. the name is Mountain. This one is Mountain Merit. Mountain but, Merit. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll we'll have to try that. And we'll go now to Ron, who is calling us from Lewistown. <clears throat> Ron, what's your question, please? Is Ron there? We will go to Barbara, who is calling us from State College. Barbara, are you on the line? I'm here. Hi, Barbara. What's your question for our guests? Well, I have two invasive weeds in my yard, and one um, is called garlic mustard, and I'm pretty sure I know how to get rid of that because I've looked it up. You pull it out by the roots. And it comes and, out very easily. Right, and you can see it. It grows tall, and you can get at it. The other one is much more difficult, and it's mixed in with uh, just a sea of myrtle. It's sometimes called vinca, I think, mm -hmm. a low ground cover. Um, and it's vetch, which was, I believe, developed at Penn State. So Crown maybe vetch. the Penn State uh, experts know how to get rid of it, too. Crown vetch you were talking about, Barbara? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Tom Butzler, can you, can you help her out here? Yeah. I, really, uh, the same method that you're using to get rid of your garlic mustard, basically hand pulling, uh, is going to be your only option with this uh, uh, crown vetch in your vinca min uh, minor or myrtle, some people call it. They're both broadleaf weeds. Uh, there's not an herbicide that's selective for um, this invasive weed that you're talking about um, as opposed to the vinca. So really at this point, the only option you have is, is just hand pulling. And it may take a couple years to, to really rogue it out of that, um, uh, that landscape bed. And as you said, John, it's never too early uh, to start weeding and you have some tools that are, are good for weeding whether it's a vegetable garden or, or a flower garden. Yeah, yeah, I, I brought some tools, um, several of them and, and different tools have different uses. Uh, this is a, a, a cultivating tool. It's, it's got three prongs and you basically just pull that through the soil. Um, Works, works well if you do it early, and that's, that's the important thing, is when you're, when you're weeding, you wanna start early. Um, for example, like in your vegetable garden around your tomatoes, if you just do a nice shallow cultivation around those tomatoes, when the weeds are real tiny or even before you see those weeds, um, you can destroy just hundreds or thousands of weeds and not even realizing it because you're, you're destroying them before they come up. If you use this tool once those weeds get two or three inches tall, it won't work very well, okay? Because what it does is that, that weed will just kind of move to the side and, and it doesn't take it out. So at that point, you'd want to move to something like it. This is basically a, like a small hoe, and, and that does a better job of pulling out weeds that are a little bit bigger. Uh, and a lot of times you, you would actually chop that, that weed in half. Is, is that effective? So the root's still in the ground? No. Right. Okay. Yeah, it, it slows the weed down, but it continues to okay. grow. 
I, I purchased this little thing. I, I got it from one of the seed catalogs. It's called Le Weeder. But this works well for real small weeds that are just starting to come up. And what's nice about this is it, it just goes very shallow. So you just drag that across the top of the soil. What we've got is a, is a triangle, a triangular metal. Right. Yeah. Describe and, and what that is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a band of, of metal bent in a triangle. And so it gives you like a blade. It's almost like a hoe blade, but it, it's lighter and easier to use. And, <clears throat> and it works real well for those weeds that are just, just sprouting. And that's the key to weed control in, in a vegetable garden is, is do it early and do it often. And by often, it's every couple of days. You better be out at, there. Yeah, at least once a week. At least once a week, okay. If you do it that way, then you don't have to be digging deep. And when you dig deep, you know, if you go through with a tiller or even with a, a hoe, sometimes you can dig deep, deep enough that you're damaging the roots of your vegetables. And so by doing it early and often, you're, you're preserving those roots and, and your, your plants are going to do better. Okay. All right, we go to Ron from Lewistown. Are you there, Ron? Yes, I am. Hi. What's your question, please? I want to know what I can put on my roses. I have 10 rose bushes in front of my house, and something every year eats the leaves off of them. All right, so you have some, uh, Ron, so you have some sort of uh, insect? Um... Uh, I, I try to look at it and see what it is, and every once in a while, I see a minute green, little green worm. Okay. And, and, and you feel that that's uh, what is causing the holes in your I, leaf? I or... think so. I'm trying to look at these, these limbs that are, I'm sorry, these uh, stems that have no leaves on, and every once in a while I'll see a real, real small little wee green worm. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, there are a couple insect species that go after uh, roses. Um, I, I think the one that I, I see most often in the landscape are your Japanese beetles, but they, they're usually on there during the day. You can see them feeding pretty heavily. Um, I'm not sure what, um, what larval species you're talking about. I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of them out there that, that go after rose leaves. Um, you, know, you know, you only said, Ron, you said you had 10 plants or? I have 10, 10 different varieties okay. in front of the house. Okay. And it, these are large blooms. Some of them get four and five inches across. But just about mid-season, all of a sudden, the leaves start to disappear up through until all of a sudden, just about all the leaves are chewed off. Okay, and, and let me just ask, when you say your rose bushes, are, are these some of the older varieties? Some of the, uh, I have some new ones and some older ones. Okay, and they're both responding the same way? I mean, they're... Exactly. Okay, uh -huh. okay. The reason I was asking that, there are some foliar diseases that cause our, our, our older rose bushes to, to lose those leaves, and they're, they're basically just stems. Those are the ones that are affected the most, my older ones. Okay. Well, I, I, then I wonder maybe if, if we're talking about a uh, fungus called black spot. You may uh -huh. have some insect activity there, but when you're talking about your older varieties, most of them losing their leaves completely, um, that would lead me to believe that you might have black spot on it. Now, when these leaves are falling off, do, do you notice any discoloration on the leaves themselves, or are they just uh, green? Uh, uh, sort, of a, sort of a dark, dark, the leaves kind of want to, like you say, they want to kind of turn black. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you really have so much of an insect problem as you have a disease problem. Okay. Um, and what I would do there is maybe just to make sure that's exactly what you have, is take some samples to your local extension office and have uh, some of the master gardeners who um, are trained by my, people like me and, and John uh, look at those and diagnose that correctly before you take that next step. And okay. It, and if it is a disease, um, you know, your options are kind of limited at this point in that you may want to use a, a fungicide or for some of those older varieties, uh, you know, if you don't want to be applying a fungicide on a regular basis, because this will uh -huh. be multiple times throughout the uh, growing season, you may want to eventually slowly replace those with some of the newer varieties. Okay. Um, now, so, I do have some newer varieties, which I just planted the last few years, and, uh, you know, they're gorgeous. My, sure. And, but all of a sudden, uh, about mid-season, uh, I, I, something is eating them. Okay, yeah, some of the newer varieties, now that, that black spot should not be a problem. Uh -huh. uh, these newer varieties have... Are resistant. Most, yeah, most of them are. I, I don't know which varieties you have or which ones you, you, you recently planted. But I would take a look at those leaves. Yes, there are some insect problems, but that's usually not the, the biggest issue with, with roses. And there well, are county I, extension that's offices. What I wondered is when, when I notice the leaves gone, I try to get down close and I can't really see anything that's eating them. That's what bothers me. Right. 
That, that, that's, you know, with the information that you have provided, uh, it sounds like black spot. But again, to correctly diagnose that, I would take that to um, uh, your local extension office. There's one in every county. And he's in Lewistown. Okay, yep. And just take that, and uh, there's Master Gardeners down there. I went down there and did some training for them. Uh, so I know they're down there. <laughs> and uh, just have them give it a, a, a check through and just make sure that's what it is. All right, thank you for your call, Ron. We go to uh, David, who's calling us from Williamsport. <coughs> You're on the air, David. <coughs> Yeah, I'd like to know about these new varieties of uh, tomatoes when they say they're blight resistant or are they blight proof. Do they have to be sprayed anyhow? Because I had planted uh, Goliath and they were supposed to be blight resistant and they they blighted anyhow. They were beautiful tomatoes and they're, they're really good taste and they got huge and the plants were real stocky and everything and uh, I had sprayed them, but they still blighted anyhow, and they said they were blight resistant. So these new John. tomatoes, are they blight proof, or are they just resistant? All to right. A okay. Extent? John. Yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think you got some bad information. Goli Goliath is a good variety, but the one thing about it is it, it is not blight resistant. Okay. Um, yeah. When you when you're spraying, um, you, you'll want to make sure that you know. If you're going to start spraying, you kind of have to do it kind of on a consistent basis, especially when we get some cool weather, uh, cool and wet weather. Um, blights like the, you know, from 65, 75, those, that temperature, um, and, some, and some rain, you know, wet foliage with it. Um, so, I, yeah, so don't, don't judge these new varieties. These new varieties are much, much better at resisting disease than but he still raises an interesting question. Do you need to spray these blight resistant, this mountain? No. Variety, okay. No. Yeah. So if um, someone's telling you to spray, this is not no. a, a blight resistant I, variety. I mentioned I, I had had, uh, one of the plant breeders would send the varieties when they were just starting to evaluate them <clears> and, and just to get some feedback. And um, I had varieties that were susceptible to blight right next to these and they, late blight came in, wiped them out um, at the end of August Yours were the, still standing? The blight-resistant varieties were finally killed about a month later with the frost. Oh, okay. So they, they have very good resistance. Now, over time, that resistance may wear down, but, you know, that remains to be seen. So right now, we're, we're very confident in these varieties as far as the disease resistance. All right. We go to Don from Williamsport. Don, you're on the air. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, I uh, have what is called Creeping Charlie. It's a green uh, weed that grows in the grass, seems to spread, and, and what's the best solution for eradicating that? There Tom? doesn't seem to be much on the market that does a good job. Yeah, it, it, it's a broadleaf weed, kind of grows along um, uh, in amongst the, um, the, the grass. Is that what yeah, we're talking about, Don? Purple Dawn? flowers. Yeah. Purple flowers. Oh, I have that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess there are two options with that. One is just to resign to the fact that, you know, you're not going to have a weed-free lawn. Um, celebrate the diversity in your lawn, <laughs> I, I suppose. Um, you know, the, the other option is to use a broadleaf herbicide, something that you can spray all over the lawn, uh, won't hurt the grass, harm the grass, and then uh, we'll take out your broadleaf weeds, such as the creeping charlie, dandelions, clover, things like that. If his yard is like mine, it's in big clumps. Yeah. Um, in you my know, backyard. I mean, if, if, if it's a really small yard and you have some time, you can try hand pulling it, but you have to make sure you get every little piece out because as it creeps, it just sends down out roots and kind of goes along its merry way. Um, you know, when you mentioned things on the market, there, there are some products on the market. Um, some of these uh, herbicides for use on lawns have two or three different active ingredients um, in that uh, uh, herbicide, and uh, they're, they're effective. I would read the label and see if that weed is on that label. So uh, really, uh, those are your two options. Third, if it's a small lawn by hand pulling, but that's kind of, that's really hard to do. So either accept it or uh, head to a local hardware store or a garden center and uh, read the label and see what's uh, labeled for that. Are there optimal times to apply this? I mean, is now the time to apply a herbicide to your lawn? Or yeah. is any time? I mean, I know for fertilizing, there's a 
Yeah, there, there are some the better of... times and some worse times. Uh, in the heat of the summer, when 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 both the grass and weeds are not really actively growing, uh, it's it's hard for herbicides to work, and that also occurs in the vegetable industry. It just doesn't. It's not real effective. But at this point, when when things are actively growing, uh, it is time. a good time to target. Yes. Okay. All right. Good luck with that. Uh, we go to Bill from Altoona. You're on the air, Bill. Okay, Patty. Uh, <laughs> my question is that we planted. Uh, I can't hear, hear you. Oh, you go Can ahead. You... Oh, we okay, can hear you. Okay, I'm watching you. <laughs> uh, we planted bamboo, and brave, you're brave. <laughs> well, no, uh, it grew so fast, and it started just to go everywhere. We was afraid it was going to invade our neighbors, and I hired a guy, and he came down, and we he cut it down pretty close to the ground, and I purchased these like two and a half gallons of uh, Roundup concentrate. And I walked behind him, and I, uh, he cut it, and I sprayed it, because you had to get it into the plant real quick, you know. Now, now all that's gone, and I got these stumps about maybe three, five inches out of the ground. Some of them, you know, I can stand on them and can't even bend them. And I got to get rid of this because this is on the corner of my property, and it's terrible. <laughs> Sounds like he's going to be digging something up. Yeah, I, I, I haven't had a lot of experience with bamboo other than, you know, seeing it spread massively. Yeah, in, his in experience yeah. Is, is why I said brave, because my husband wants to grow it, and I say no way. There are some because, varieties that, that... But there's a lot of precautions you need to take for, for some of yes, them. Yes, I mean, over at the Penn State Arboretum, they have some bamboo varieties, and if you look at how they planted it, and you can see that they've got some barriers up so that bamboo doesn't spread throughout uh, the Arboretum, so it's kind of confined. But Inside as, a metal trash can sometimes with the bottom yeah, out. Yeah. Yep, yep, something that just prevents it from moving mm -hmm. off-site. Um, yeah, so they're not re-sprouting, so the issue is not really control now. It's just getting rid of the, uh, the stumps from what the caller had mentioned. And uh, other than... Digging take, it out, right? Well, either digging it or uh, cutting it off at the uh, soil line with maybe a chainsaw, saw, small chainsaw, or there are some... Uh, outfitters that have stump grinders, maybe bring that in and you can take that out uh, pretty quickly, something mm -hmm. like that. But I, I don't have a lot of experience, experience removing okay. bamboo. I would never jo want to plant them in my yard. <laughs> John, anything uh, to add? Not really. Okay. Um, sometimes just adding a little fertilizer, a little bit of nitrogen helps things break down just slightly more quickly, but it, you're still looking at a long term you know, for that, that woody material to mm -hmm. break down. Okay. There's a, there's a reason it's... Uh, uh, I mean, you can make all kinds of wood products, flooring yep, products yep, out of bamboo, right, all kinds right. of things. So, mm -hmm. well, good luck with that. We go to Robert, who's calling us from Monday's Corner. Go ahead, please, Robert. Yes, thank you for taking my call. And uh, I have a, a stone wall about 50 foot long, and I have Boston ivy growing on it. And I'm trying to get the Boston ivy eliminated there. It's so evasive. And the deer ate all the tops off of the, the ivy. And I want to kill that all and reset my stone. What kind of spray can I use to alleviate that uh, Boston ivy in the stones? Okay. Uh, so you, you want to lim eliminate, he wants to eliminate the Boston ivy right. completely. Well, uh, you know, I always like to give other recommendations other than in pesticides. And if possible, I mean, you can do some hand pulling and make sure you pull out the roots. There's a lot of underground storage structures there. Pull that out because it is a perennial. So you can eliminate it by, by hand pulling. Um, the other option is to use some sort of uh, a pesticide product, something like Roundup um, or a broadleaf herbicide. And if it's really well established, it may take more than one application. Um, uh, there are some products out there that are labeled for woody, or, uh, woody plant material, and that may be a one-pass uh, approach. But it may take more than uh, one, um, one time to get, to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So okay. either hand pooling or an herbicide, Garden Center would carry that product. All right. Good luck to you. <clears throat> if you're just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live. Get your garden on. Our guests uh, are uh, Tom Butzler. He is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator in Clinton County. John Esslinger is Penn State Extension horticulture educator in northeastern Pennsylvania. And our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242. And our panelists are ready to take your call. You can also email your question to connect at WPSU.com. Org, or if you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can tweet a question to 
at WPSU. Before I take this call from Carol in Huntington, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some things that you brought with you, uh, uh, Tom. Uh, first, I'd like to begin with some things that I think a lot of people may be seeing in their landscape with uh, with evergreens, and this is this bagworm. Right. Can you show us show us what it is, yeah. uh, what it does to a tree, and how you might be able to tackle it if it's if it's in your landscape? Um, I'm seeing more and more of this in, in Pennsylvania. This is an insect, uh, the common name is, is bagworm, and it forms a bag. Um, what it does is it, uh, the, uh, the little caterpillar will start to feed on the, uh, the needles, uh, gain some nutrients from there, but also use some of the needles to build their, their nest. So and it's hard to tell, really. It almost looks like a pine cone hang hanging exactly, from this exactly. evergreen. And that's part of the problem, that uh, as a homeowner's walking around and, and looking at their landscape, they may see this and think, oh, that's kind of interesting, and not give it a second thought. But in each one of these bags, the female will lay anywhere from 500 to 1,000 eggs. Those eggs will hatch in the spring. They'll come out at the bottom of this little bag. And they can't really, f they're, they're little caterpillars, they can't fly, so they'll move to the next branch. So you have 500 to 1,000 of these out of one bag moving to nearby mm. branches. And Decimating after another it. year or two, you'll have a, a, a pine tree or a spruce tree that's completely absence of, um, of, new, of needles. So uh, with, with homeowners, I mean, it's always a good idea to walk around your landscape, just enjoy the flowers, but also see what's going on. And if you happen to see one hanging there, the easiest thing to do is just snip off that bag and, and throw it in the garbage. And you've eliminated the potential of 500 to 1,000 insects um, in the spring. If you don't cl clip that one off, then you will end up with something like this, and it, it, it's very difficult to control. And, and in a matter of a year or two, your tree is probably going to die. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're, our, a lot of our conifers, once they lose needles, they can't recover. Now, our deciduous trees, if for some reason, if they lose their leaves, they can put out a new flush of growth. So, there's, you know, our deciduous trees are a little more forgiving. Yeah, our pines and spruces, once their needles are gone, they're done. Now, of course, lots of people uh, are familiar with what's happening to hemlocks around the state. Tell us a little bit about uh, the woolly adelgid and, and what it's doing, what it looks like in right. the landscape. Right, right. Well, you know, hemlocks are a favorite tree um, in, in the landscape, but it's also um, uh, in a lot of our naturalized settings. You know, it's a favorite uh, in the state. The state tree, actually. Yeah, it's state, yes, yeah it very, yep, that's right. And the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, feeds at the base of the needles. So if you looked at a hemlock where the needles are coming into the stem, feeds at the base of the needles. And at this time of year, um, they're secreting this substance, and it looks like little cotton balls at the base of the needle. And what this little insect is doing is extracting the nutrients uh, from the hemlock. And it's kind of a slow death with a hemlock, whereas we talked with a bagworm, which can defoliate a tree in a year and it dies. A hemlock, once it's affected with this hemlock woolly adelgid, Will, will decline over several year periods and then several years and then it will eventually die. Um, you know, it's, it's somewhat easy to control in the landscape. There are some products, just safe insecticidal soaps, some of the horticulture oils, they're relatively safe, um, can, can control it. But on a large scale, like in our naturalized settings, it's really difficult um, and, in and fact, expensive. Yeah, and you see, uh, and I know there are some efforts to, to save some of these trees where there are large stands of, uh, of hemlock, but you will see just small little pieces of the tree all over the, all over the uh, ground. Yeah, they'll start losing their needles, yeah. and yeah, it's a slow decline. And they are looking at some biological controls. They're looking at insects over in Japan where this hemlock woolly adelgid comes from. And looking at bringing some of them, so some of those over here to maybe control this this adelgid. Okay, before we we take Carol's call, you did bring some beneficials, uh, some things that you might see in your landscape. Yeah. Uh, the praying mantis, which of course we want to attract to our garden. What does it look like? Uh, um, well, I guess it's kind of hard to describe. It looks like a, a, a spherical structure on some sort of plant material. I have uh, some praying ma uh, mantis egg cases on some ornamental ornamental grasses and on some uh, twigs. And it's kind of it looks like cardboard. And uh, the, the female mantis in the, uh, in the fall creates this like frothy mess, mass, uh, puts it on a twig, uh, lays her eggs in it, and it hardens. And it just hangs uh, uh, on this twig or grass uh, over the winter months. And then once spring comes along, temperatures warm up, uh, little praying mantises will come out and they'll kind of move around and, and forage. And is there something uh, homeowners can do to attract praying mantis to the landscape? Yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing is, uh, is not to use, rely on pesticides in your landscape. I mean, there's a lot of beneficial insects, and praying mantises are one of those. 
Although I should qualify that praying mantis will eat anything. They'll even eat their brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, I mean, they eat good bugs and they eat bad bugs. Okay. But uh, the idea is that to attract beneficials into your landscape, uh, you, you want to not really rely on a lot of these insecticides because a lot of these insecticides go after both good and bad. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about bees in a minute. But first, Carol, I promise we would get to you. What's your question, please? It's about tomatoes. I'd like to hear about the new grafted tomatoes and also the use of red plastic to increase production. Good questions. John? Okay. Uh, yeah, one of, one of our co uh, co-workers worked on that for, for quite a few years. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the red plastic. Uh, the red plastic, um, what they found is that about half the time they got increased yields and size of tomatoes when they use red plastic mulch uh, versus, say, a black plastic or just bare ground. So, Do they know why? Well, they, they said that the, that the years when they had a lot of stress on the plants, the red plastic did better. On years we had good, nice, even growing system where there wasn't a lot of stress on the plants, it, it didn't make any difference. But what difference does color make? I'm kind of curious about that. Well, plants respond to different colors. Um, the, the fact of the, the light reflecting off of the mulch, just it somehow it helps the plants grow better. Okay, and, yeah. and when you say mulch, you're calling a plastic sheet yes. mulch. Okay. Yes, yes. It's it's a weed barrier, but also, and it helps hold moisture, but also that, that reflective color does have an impact on the plant. Okay, and now the, the tomato variety that she asked about? She asked about grafting. Okay, yeah. about uh, grafting, yeah, that, that's a new practice. Um, it, it's used a lot where you're, you're growing a variety, like an heirloom variety, that may not have a lot of good natural disease resistance and they graft that onto a root of a different tomato that has good you know, disease resistance. The way you do on an apple tree? It's similar, yes. Okay. Uh, the way they do it is they, they take plants while they're small, cut them at a, a sharp angle, and just basically put, you know, take the, the top off of one and put it on the bottom of a different variety. And they just use a little clip or a little piece of like a rubber tubing and just holds it there. And you put that in the dark for about four or five days and you keep it nice and moist and let that knit back together and then you slowly let it out of the dark and once it grows together it just acts like a normal tomato plant. And so now you have a tomato plant that is producing two different varieties of tomatoes? No. No, okay. No, it's just the root and, and typically it's for root diseases and so that variety will actually grow better. Um, a grow lot better of gardeners... Heirlooms. Yeah, you'll okay. grow better and, and you get a little bit of a yield boost just because of the interaction of the two different different varieties. Okay. Um, Did we answer your question, Carol? Yeah. Yes, it, thank you very much. You were going to say more, though. I'm sorry, Well, I was going to say, it, it's, it's more important where you've got a disease problem, especially a disease problem in the soil. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if I, if I don't, have, you know, don't have that problem, haven't had a lot of problems uh, with diseases as far as root diseases. I don't know that I would spend the extra money to, to buy a grafted plant. Um, yeah, okay. they're, they're, they're new. They're kind of a novelty right now, and, and kind of watch and see how they do. All right. Ken from Mount Union, you're on the air. Uh, yeah. I, I got tomato plants, a Rutgers I usually plant, or a marigold. But the, the stem towards the, down towards the ground after the plant gets, I'd just say, grow it up to the height it's going to grow. They start dying off before I get all my, tom you know, produce any tomatoes worthwhile. Is there something in the ground that's doing that or what? It, and could, could you tell us a little more of what you're seeing? Is, is it the leaves getting spots on them or is it the stem itself that's dying? The leaves sort of, uh, you know, just turn them brown and, and they okay. die off. Okay. Now, w one more question. Are, are you keeping your seed from year to year, or are you buying new seed? I buy new, uh, new plants every year. Okay, good. Uh, you're probably looking at early blight. Uh, early blight typically starts on the bottom of the plant. It, it'll start out as a dark spot. You'll get a little bit of yellowing around that spot, and it, as the season goes on, it slowly moves up the plant. Uh, just the fact of the, the disease there kind of takes some of the strength out of the plant, makes it less productive. And, and eventually it will kill the plant. Now, the fact that he's seeing this year after year, there's some things that he can do. For example, if he's, if he's using a stake, that stake is contaminated from year to year. So he needs to do things 
uh, to that stake so that he's not contaminating next year's crop. Th that's right. Um, you know, several diseases can overwinter on the stake, and so when you you take that stake and, and you put it in your garage or leave it outside even, um, put that stake back in, put it next to a young tender plant, it picks that disease up from that stake and then the disease just gets started again. The, the other thing with early blight So he is, can use Clorox or something on that stake to, to kill? Yes, yeah. To kill Tip, the contaminants. Yeah, the, the, the rule of thumb for stakes is, is we want them submerged in a 10% Clorox solution for a minimum of 10 minutes. So just remember those 10s. 10% Clorox for a minimum of 10, you know, completely submerged for at least 10 minutes. And John, how about those who are using metal cages? Do those have to be decontaminated as well? It, it's a good idea. Metal cages carry less disease, but there are some bacterial diseases that will overwinter on, on the metal. Um, so it's a good idea to do, do that for them also. And then how important is crop rotation? That, that's what okay. I, that was going to be in my next point, is if, if you're growing the tomatoes in the same spot each year, then you could have some, that old residue, the leaves that have fallen off that are in the soil, that early blight is living on those diseases and it's ready the next year to infect the new planting. So you, you want to try to move them you know, as far away from that spot you know, in your garden as, as you possibly can. And then finally, are there ways that he could water that would reduce the risk of blight? For example, not watering the flower, but watering the root. Yes. Um, ag again, early blight likes cool, wet weather. Um, and it needs a certain amount of time for the foliage to be wet. So anytime you can reduce the, the time that the foliage is, is got moisture on it, um, that will reduce disease. So, you know, a soaker hose, trickle tape, something like that works better for, for watering. Okay. Uh, we go to a Twitter question. Someone has a, a question about slugs. Can you talk about how to defeat slugs? They're my nemesis. And you're our bug expert, aren't you, Tom? Uh, I <laughs> I mean, slugs are a problem both in the ornamental landscape and, and the, uh, uh, the vegetable industry. Um, you know, the, the slugs, they like a moist cli uh, environment, uh, so one of the things you could do is, is try to dry things out. I mean, it sounds kind of counterintuitive because both in the landscape and in, in vegetable production, we encourage mulching, and that kind of is a, a, a moist environment. I mean, mm -hmm. you see, you see um, uh, it a lot on, on summer vegetable crops, and we see it a lot on our flower crops in the, in the, in the mulch. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, the one thing you could do, I, I've, I've done this a couple times when I've tried to get some of my uh, marigolds started out in uh, some of the beds, is I've put out little beer traps, and uh, the, the yeast smell attracts those, uh, the slugs to the beer traps. And they drown And them? they drown, okay. right. Um, the only problem that it was a constant struggle with my dogs. Um, they weren't walking around loopy or anything, but they would go out and kind of knock them over, take a couple licks with that. Um, so, you know, that's one way to do that. Um, uh, the other way, again, there are some, some baits out there that you can put, but then you got to worry about pets. Will they take that up? So there, there's, there's that. I don't know uh, in the vegetable there, industry. There is a, a product, uh, it's actually organically approved, I believe, is, is iron phosphate, and, and it's... Um, Sluggo is the brand name of it, and that, that's a safer product. There's also metaldehyde, but metaldehyde is a little more toxic. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that helps, and, and this is kind of a funny thing, but coffee grounds, that the slugs cannot digest the coffee, the caffeine. And so by repeatedly putting the coffee grounds in your garden, you will reduce the, the number of slugs that you have there. And are there any consequences to the plant? I mean, what does coffee? What are coffee grinds introducing to your plant? Um, actually, any... there, there's some beneficial oh, okay. things. There's some potassium in that in that coffee, and yeah, some some beneficial things there too. Okay, boy, that I like that one. Uh, Don from Pennsylvania Furnace, what's your question, please? I was wondering how to uh, establish night crawlers, garden worms, etc., in my yard and garden. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I, we don't add pesticides. Um, I, I line the yard. I try to use uh, straw mulch in the garden, and we put the clippings, you know, back on the grass and stuff with a mulching mower. I've I still have very few uh, garden worms and night crawlers on the property. I have but a compost one. pile that looks like a, a horror movie. There are so many. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah, I, you, Don. Um, yeah, I, I use a lot of manure in my garden, and again, th there's food safety issues with manure, so you have to be careful, put it on way ahead. Um, 
but yeah, man manure, they like manure. Um, the, just the fact that it's got a lot of nitrogen in it, um, it, it seems to really help them. But other than, you know, continue to do what you're doing, it sounds like you're doing a lot of good things, but, you know, maybe add some manure to, to maybe help them more, make it more attractive. Wasn't maybe a lot of vegetable scraps, you know, out of the kitchen, a lot of vegetable scraps, just keep on adding that organic matter. It would yeah. be really but, helpful. But wasn't there a controversy recently about whether uh, worms are, are helping your garden or actually taking nutrients from it? The, the, that that yeah, seemed the, to be, I, I read the, about the that last year. The concern is that, that worms are, I mean, they're actually decomposers. And so there's concern that, well, if you've got a lot of worms, then they're breaking that organic da matter down too quickly. And, and your plants aren't getting to take advantage of it. Right. You, you like to have that organic matter break down slowly. So it, it's releasing the, the nutrients slowly and it, it builds soil tilth where, um, you know, but I, I like worms. I mean, okay. I like having worms in my garden. And to me, that's a good sign that, that the soil's healthy and things are, are good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we go to Gloria from State College. Gloria, you're on the air. Uh, yes. I, uh, my garden is infested with bishop's weed, which has very long and deep roots. And very fine, but they're amazingly strong. I've tried a systemic weed killer. A few times I've been able to isolate the plant from other plants. That didn't work. What, what, what can I do? Are you familiar with bishop's weed, Tom? Uh, you know, not, not really. But I guess when you applied it, uh, Gloria, when you applied that to, to the weed, that herbicide, did, did it burn it down? Did it kill it temporarily? No, no. Didn't seem to have any effect on it. Mm. It's very disappointing. You know, I had to spread out a lot of plastic and... Well, I, I guess, you know, you, you, I'm not real familiar with that weed, but I guess the only thing I can, uh, that I, I can think of is that it's got a deep energy uh, storage structure underneath the ground, and, and you just kind of have to dig that up. But I'm not real familiar with that weed. I don't, John? Yeah, the, 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 the one thing about Roundup and those type products is that the timing is very important. Um, if you can put Roundup on or, or a glyphosate type product when the, the plant is flowering or just beyond flowering, uh, that's a time when the plant is actually taking the material up and putting it down in the root. If you put it on too early while the plant's just coming out and, and it's taking nutrients out of the root and going up, then it doesn't take the Roundup down and it doesn't kill the plant very well. And so it might just be a matter of timing. Is she too late to apply Roundup now? I, I'm not familiar with that weed either. Okay, all um, right. So I'm not sure. All right, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some other people here in our staff who have the same problem. So, but it, with a lot of the perennial weeds, it sounds like it's a perennial weed. You know, sometimes even one application of an herbicide is is not enough because it's so well established that it may take multiple applications or digging up that uh, underground structure. Um, there's just a large energy energy reserve there that it can just resprout. Okay, it sounds like it blooms in the summer. Okay. So um, we go, actually we have uh, an email question. This one is about uh, soil testing. I'm new to the State College area. Can you comment on the soil content and what a newcomer gardener should know, especially for growing a flower garden? I see lots of raised beds here. This wasn't done where I came from in eastern Pennsylvania. Well, I I, I, you know, it's, it's good that you're thinking about a soil test because whenever you do any gardening, whether it is uh, vegetable gardening or, you know, in the landscape, we really encourage uh, doing a soil test before starting anything. Uh, we, you know, some of our soils are very acidic, uh, but we do have some soils that are on limestone outcroppings. And, a lot and, of clay. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. and a lot of clay. And so doing a soil test kind of gives you a, 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 a starting point. What needs to be done? Do you need to add some phosphorus and potassium? Uh, what is the pH? Do you need need the lime? Or you know, if you're um, a planting blueberries or some more some of these acidic type plants in the landscape, do you need to bring that pH down a little bit? So you know, the soil test is a great place. Good we actually have an example of a, of a soil test and the kinds of information the homeowner will get back. So maybe it would help to know how you do a good 
soil test. It isn't enough just to take a scoop, a random scoop of your garden. You need to uh, be more scientific about uh, what you're putting into your sample bag. Right. Well, the idea is, let's just say you're taking it from your yard, is not to take it out of one location because who knows what happened in that one location with the previous owner. This individual just moved to this area. But to take a kind of a, do a pattern throughout the, the yard, we're just using the yard as an example, and you, you go down to a, a depth, depending on what crop you're dealing with, about three or four inches, take a, a soil sample at one location, move to another, take another sample, and continue moving throughout the lot yard, maybe 10, 15 samples, put them in a bucket, mix that up, and take a composite sample out of that, uh, out of that bucket and submit that. Um, Penn State does have a soil testing uh, laboratory uh, that will run the analysis for you, but there are some also some private companies. Mm -hmm. And you'll get back information about what you're high or low in and, and, and what sorts of and things And then what you needs need. to be done to correct it for that crop. When you fill out the soil sample sheet, it asks you what, what are you planting? Are you planting tomatoes, blueberries? Is it for turf? Um, is it for a, uh, some woody ornamental shrubs and what are they? So, it, so that way they can kind of hone in the, the recommendations specifically for what you're trying to do. And of course, if she goes the, uh, the raised bed route, she can control completely uh, what her soil is. Well, yeah, yeah. She, it's still a good idea if it's using, a, sometimes these raised beds, they put in a lot of peat, uh, maybe some vermiculite because maybe it is clay soil. and. They're trying to encourage good drainage. So yeah, they can, they can control things a little better. Mm -hmm. so, so what are, are there other advantages to, uh, to raised beds and are they more popular in, in central Pennsylvania than they are in eastern Pennsylvania? John? It might just be that it's cooler here and that just the benefit of a, it's warmer. In a raised bed, you're, it's, it's a warmer environment for the plants because they're, they're up and they're in, into the sun and, and the warmer air. So you know, for that reason, it might be better. but. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of reasons people use raised bed. Uh, sometimes just just older people just mm -hmm. not wanting to bend over. That's right. um, and know, easier for weed control, isn't it? Yeah, keeps keeps the rabbits out. You know, I mean, there's 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 some nice advantages. There's some expense involved. That that's one deterrent. You know, against them. Um, the other thing is is getting good soil. Um, sometimes it's hard to get you know a good quality soil. You know, especially one that's got a lot of organic matter and things like that in it. Not you, you can amend any soil, but it's hard to get a good soil that's kind of ideal right from the beginning. And I think it's also important what you build your raised beds out of, because if you're using womanized wood, for example, you may be introducing arsenic or other toxins to a vegetable garden if you happen to be growing vegetables. Yeah, yeah. A treated lumber is really not recommended. Um, you know, you want to get something that sometimes people are using um, Oh, some oils and things like that, that that they're you know treating that wood with to try to help preserve it a little bit, but in time it, it's going to break down, but it, it does take quite a bit of time. Mm. Okay. We go to Daryl, who's calling us from Martinsburg. What's your question, Daryl? Hi, Patty. Hi there. Um, I have a question for the panel. Uh, I, I've lived here on my property for about 20 years now, and uh, I've tried to plant and, and grow onions. Believe it or not, I can grow everything else that a garden grows, but I can't. I can put onions in the ground, and they'll stay alive, but they will not grow. They just stay the same size. You can take them a month or month and a half later, two months later, and they're exactly the same size. And I'm stumped, and I've never been able to find anybody with an answer. John? <laughs> Hopefully we have uh, your answer today. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of stumped too. <laughs> um, first thing I would do is, is, if you haven't gotten a soil test, get a soil test. Make sure it's not a nutritional problem. What do onions want, need? They're, they're fairly heavy feeders. They, they're not, they don't develop a real big root system. And so you've got to have that fertilizer kind of concentrated in the row. Um, but yeah, I've been growing onions a long time, and I can't say I've ever had that problem. I'm not sure what, what exactly is, could be the problem there. Um, get, get a soil test. That'll be the first place to start. Um, there, there are several insects that really go after onions. Thrips, for example. Um, thrips are real tiny. They're a long cylindrical type insect, and they're going to be right down in where the leaves come out. So you kind of have to pull those leaves apart gently and look down in and you'll see just a little tiny insect in there moving around. And are they a problem on, on neighboring plants or is it just, are they they're, particular they're to onions? They're more of a problem on onions. Okay. Um, they're actually, it's the onion thrip. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they can actually 
deform the leaves and, and stunt the plant so that he'll get that result of, of you know, there's just not enough energy there to make a bulb. And how do you get rid um, of thrips? Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> One thrip, two yeah. thrips, they're all thrips. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, there, there is, there is a, a, uh, a, a product that, that's very safe. There's actually a formulation of it that's organically approved, but it, it's called spinosad. And spinosad is very good on thrips. The trick with that is you need to aim it right down into the heart of the plant because that's where the thrips are. Um, but it, it's a biological type insecticide and it works well on them. Okay, maybe give that a try, Daryl. We hope you have good, lucks, uh, good luck with your onions this year. Uh, Edward from Center County, you're on the air. Hi. I have a problem with my lung. I have an African virus that I've not been able to get rid of. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, in your yard? Yes. Okay, African violets in the yard? I don't know that they're really African violets. Yeah, I'm not sure they're... But, they're I, but I know what he's talking about. It's a little teeny purple flower. Yeah, yeah. It's a broadleaf weed in Probably the lawn. Hand bit. What's that? Probably henbit. No, I Possibly. mean, just a, well, just a violet. Okay. Well, okay. I don't know exactly. He's saying African violets. I'm assuming that he's talking about the kind of the violets you see in the naturalized settings and so forth. Um, it's a broadleaf weed. Um, you know, if it's not too bad, just kind of going out with a little uh, little hand spade and just digging it up comes kind of like um, you know like a dandelion getting that root structure out of that uh, lawn or out of that landscape bed. Um, that's one option, and the other option is to use some type of herbicide to go after that broadleaf weed in amongst the the grass. So. All right. Thank you for your call, Edward. We go to Maggie, your, uh, who's calling us from Williamsport. What's your question, please, Maggie? Hi. About eight years ago, I had a nursery plant eight evergreen trees in a row like they're quite common they're uh, like a broad leaf and people you see them they're real familiar you see them uh, people use them for borders and that well last year one started to turn orange and this year it's all orange just one little bit of green and it didn't get the other ones just that one and I wanted to know because I want to replace it. These trees are like eight foot now, so to purchase another one is going to be quite expensive at that height. And what could I, should I plant it in there, or what should I do? I'm going to hang up so I can hear the answer. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, well, it would have been, been nice to ask oh, you know, okay. Maggie a, a, a question <laughs> Maybe or Maggie two. Maybe Maggie can call yeah. back. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I guess... It, you really want to find out why that one plant died. Um, you know, is it something that uh, girdled the stem at the soil line and it caused the tree to, to die that way, or do we have a root dealing with a root rot problem? Because the worst thing to do would be go back into that uh, same area with the same plant, and you have this disease organism in the soil, and it's going to it's going to kill that. Although she didn't say that. She it said moved. it lived eight years. Well, it lived eight years, but it. I, you know, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. um, is it spreading to the other trees? Does she notice any discolor discoloration uh, with the trees on either side? Or even something like the bagworm we were talking about earlier? Would that cause a tree to go orange? No. No, it wouldn't yeah. go. No, okay. it wouldn't go orange. Um, so I, I guess I'd be kind of curious on on you know exactly what happened before recommending going in with the same plant because she may go in with the same plant and end up with the same result. Could she take a, a sample from that tree to her, her uh, county extension office? She, yeah, she could. The only problem is it, it for someone to correctly diagnose a problem, it's a good idea to see that problem as it's kind of unfolding. Just taking in a dead twig and asking someone what killed it, it it's really difficult. Um, so Maybe if she's got some pictures as, as it was dying, that might help answer that, uh, uh, that problem mm -hmm. for her. All right. Sorry, Maggie. We couldn't uh, provide anything more definitive, and, and good luck with that. Kathy from Somerset, you were on the air. Hello. Um, I have stink bugs so bad in my garden, I can't get any kind of vegetables out of my garden anymore mm -hmm. because the stink bugs just take over. I was wondering if they have anything that can kill them. They were a big problem last year for... Uh, for producers, major producers, uh, commercial producers, yeah. is there anything she can do? Short of using a, a relatively toxic insecticide, no. Um, stink bugs are hard to kill. They're, they're, <laughs> they're an intelligent insect. Um, they hear you coming. They'll fall to the ground. Uh, the way that they feed is they actually have a little needle-like uh, apparatus that they poke into the fruit 
feed underneath the skin. So if you spray the insecticide on the fruit, it doesn't impact the, the insect at all. You actually have to hit the insect with the insecticide. And, and there's been a lot of work done on what insecticides work on them, and they're, they're hard to kill. Th there is one thing that she could do that may help, and that is there's a product called Surround. Surround is a, is a clay product that you can spray on your plants, and it makes them less attractive to the stink bugs. And it, I, I've seen some results saying that about two-thirds, you'll have about two-thirds less damage if you use surround versus not not using anything at all. Okay, good luck to you. We have uh, uh, just about two, two and a half minutes remaining, so we're not gonna get to more phone calls. We apologize for that. But I, I wanna begin with you, Tom. What one practice would you like to see home gardeners adopt this season uh, to, to be more successful? Uh, well, look, I I'm a beekeeper. I, you got a couple hives in my backyard and also some behind my office. And there's a big issue with, with honeybees and other pollinators. In, they're facing a lot of problems, and one of the problems is insecticides. Uh, they're, they're pretty harsh on, on our pollinators. So. And as we noticed, that's one of the first things people want to know. What insecticide can right, they use? Right, right. And, and, and so it, it, always look for some alternatives before reaching for that, uh, that insecticide. Uh, so my, I guess my one thing is I'd like to see homeowners using uh, uh, less insecticides. There are times when they may be necessary, maybe to control the brown marmorated stink bug, but maybe look at some other options and less reliance okay. on insecticides. And, and could you tell us about the status of the honeybee? Are things looking up? No, they're not. I mean, it was a, it was a rough year. Um, across the nation right now, they're, they're, it looks like about a third of the colonies were lost. Last year was a little less. It was about 20 percent, but this year 30 percent. So it was a rough year. All right, and, and we're thinking that the, the real link is pesticides. No, nah, there's other things. Okay. I, I don't want to say it's just pesticides. So there's the varroa mite, there's the changing habitat, there's some viruses, so there's a lot of problems. Okay, John, okay. just a couple of seconds. Just, I, I'd encourage people, uh, I'm thinking here on a vegetable garden, but keep your vegetable garden fairly small. Make sure you can keep the weeds out. Weeds do a lot of damage. They carry diseases, they invite insects. So my, my thing would be just stay ahead of the weeds, keep them under control, and you'll get, a, you'll get more success out of your garden. All right, thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Sorry to those whose questions we didn't get to. Our guest tonight, Tom Butzler, a Penn State Extension horticulture educator from Clinton County, and John Esslinger, a Penn State Extension horticulture educator in northeastern Pennsylvania. Be sure to visit our website, wpsu.org slash conversations live. You'll find links to our three-minute gardener videos as well as resources on tonight's topic. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, have a good night.